Nastavljamo sa radom. Ok, let's move on. Our next speaker is Peter Montello. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say before I begin my presentation, thank you very much for inviting me, Dusan. Thank you very much for inviting me from the Center of Social and Political Research. Yes, and Bogdana. Um, originally, I was invited to a conference just a couple of days ago in Belgrade, and the genesis of that conference was uh, partly motivated by a desire to... Um, Create a, create a dialogue uh, about uh, metaphorically and directly with the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, I'm a media studies professor, and most of my work uh, deals with the intersection between popular culture and technology and various forms of media. And so uh, my idea for my, my uh, presentation, because I'm not a political scientist or an international relations person, I'm a media guy. So I wanted to explore the way in which representations of Russia and post, post uh, the, the, let's say the post uh, Cold War Russia or uh, the post Soviet era is reflected through uh, a very popular medium called video games. And what I'd like to start off with by saying is that when people generally think of the military-industrial complex, they think about three axes of influence, the state, the military, and private corporations. But what people don't really uh, consider is the media entertainment industry. And of course, the increasingly fine line between Hollywood and the Pentagon. And so today, my talk topic is going to be about video games. But it's important to understand that, like other aspects of life, Western popular culture has been greatly influenced by the events of the Cold War and the post-Cold War era. And so it would be a mistake to dismiss cultural artifacts like these as simply superficial entertainment devoid of meaning. Because in the words of uh, Louis Altusser, video games and popular culture are interpretive mechanisms, meaning that they appeal to individuals uh, to identify themselves as subjects with inclusive symbols of identity and authority, while reinforcing existing discourses of power. In the 20th century, cinema was the predominant form of ideological communication, instructing individuals in the West, and for sure in the, in the East, of ideas of patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty, and most importantly, a nation's legitimacy to engage in war. However, cinema's influence as a dominant meeting has been overtaken by the interactive world of video games. Today, there are uh, over 3 billion active video game players today. Think about it. 3 billion people, that's half the world's population, are actively playing video games today. And the industry itself is growing exponentially every year. And the industry itself today makes a combined revenue of over $179 billion. That's three times the film industry combined with sports. So as an industry, it's incredibly big and it's incredibly lucrative. So uh, I, 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 I think what accounts for this phenomenal growth and in interest? Well, unlike television and film, video game players are not simply passive witnesses to ideological messaging. They experience it directly through their on-screen other, the avatar. And unlike represent the representational nature of film, video games create highly immersive worlds that grant players the ability to make decisions and give them mobility. And they are competitions. They test the person's acumen and skill. So by analyzing Western video games, 
specifically those that deal directly or indirectly with geopolitics, we can see how Western public views of the Cold War and Russia have been remained the same or changed over time. And it's really, really interesting because the birth of the video game uh, coincided with two of the great existential uh, um, contests in the 20th century, the space race and the arms race. And one of the very first games that was created was a game called Space War, which pitted two players against each other with spaceships shooting nuclear missiles. And it's not coincidental that the two creators of this game, who were graduate students at MIT during the, the, the birth of the computer science as a discipline, uh, created the avatars for these based upon two uh, uh, ICBM missiles, the U.S. Minuteman and the Russian R-7, Semyorka. So here we have these two uh, uh, avatars as the first avatars. So, you know, in terms of the Cold War, the desire to gauge the viability of nuclear war, because it was an abstraction, and so this viability to gauge nuclear war, it became very much associated with the growing acceptance of the epistemology of the game. And so increasingly, computerized war games transformed themselves into a serious uh, form of play that would align to a Cold War logic, a philosophy of martial preparation and readiness that fit well into an extension of the war economy into peacetime. And this, game, and this, this, this type of board, electronic board, that was used at RAND and in the, uh, in, in the, in the Pentagon, was, became in many ways uh, a very uh, infamous symbol of the Cold War. Uh, and of course, we, we know that because it becomes a primary feature in the film 1964 by Dr. Strangelove. And so we see this reoccurring idea of, of the video game as an abstraction and of the Cold War itself. So if you fast forward uh, to, the, to the 1980s, one of the most popular games in the West was a game called Missile Command. And Missile Command was, was made at the same time as the stalled SALT II treaties that were going on with Russia. This, this, uh, this uh, treaty to limit the amount of nuclear weapons uh, between the two superpowers at the time. And it's very interesting because the game is played in such a way that the player it must defend cities from oncoming nuclear weapons. And if the player does not shoot down the, the nuclear weapon uh, early on, it splits into three or four sections, which is exactly one of the points of contention between the Russians and the Americans during the Cold War, during the SALT talk, two talks, was to limit the uh, missiles that had independent nuclear warheads within them. But what's really important is the game itself, the operational logic of the game, is constructed in a way that the player is, is, is playing in a defensive capacity against foreign aggression. So uh, if you look at the games of the uh, 80s, and I'll just back forward a, a bit because I, I like this this quote by Bob Rehack, he says, interfaces are ideological. They work to remove themselves from awareness seeking transparency or at least unobtrusiveness as they channel agency into new forms. And that's exactly what video games do. When you play a video game, you play against the game mechanics, the algorithm, the game's constitutional order. So in the 80s, we have the same sort of thing going on with games like NATO Commander and Balance of Power. NATO Commander was designed by one of the most famous game designers today, Sid Meier. He's responsible for the game Civilization. But NATO Commander is interesting because, again, the player is a playing, a, a playing against in a defensive position. The game starts because it's a, a single-player game. You play against the computer. The com uh, you play the uh, NATO Commander fighting against the... Uh, Soviet invasion of East Germany. And the game escalates, as the game escalates, as a military game, more and more NATO countries get on board. 
But at the same time, some countries decide to go neutral. And of course, Italy doesn't know, can't make up its mind which way to go. So it's a very interesting game in that way. But balance of power is probably more interesting because it's probably one of the, it, besides being one of the most popular games as a diplomacy game, it's also one of the most unbiased games. A player plays either the president of the United States or the leader of the Soviet Union. And they try to maximize their prestige and influence. And of course, they go out of their way to try to avoid <laughs> nuclear war. Okay. But it's interesting because if the conflict starts to go hot, then they risk the consequence, if they back down, they risk the consequences of public disapproval. And what's really interesting in this game is that if the game go, unlike many other strategy games of its time, if the, if the conflict goes into nuclear war, then the game ends right away. And what's really interesting is although the game was really popular, in, in right-wing circles in the West, there was criticism of the game, and it's very interesting because I'll just pull out one, one criticism where they criticized the game designer as having sweet delusions that as long as the United States is very nice and doesn't do anything to offend them, the Russians will go home, right? And so if you don't play this way, then he'll stop the game with a nasty remark about how the world was just destroyed by nuclear weapons. So you can see again, once again, the, the fears and phobias of the West to Russia. And in the post 9-11 era, uh, we see two existential threats of the West come together. It's not just simply the Soviet Union, but it's the Soviet Union combined with political Islam. And so the Soviet, in, in games in the uh, post 9-11 era, we see that these two combined existential threats being uh, generated in the narratives of the game, but also game play. And it's very interesting because in 2007 forward, you start to see um, uh, increasingly porous borders between the actual video game industry and the Pentagon and military industrial complex, where video game des designers are being recruited and headhunted to the military industrial complex uh, to make video games as military uh, training exercises. But then again, on the other side, you see veterans of war being recruited by uh, the video game industry to show them how to make the games more realistic. And at this point in time, for those of you who, who, uh, who have played games, you realize that the video game itself almost looks like cinema. So when you play an avatar in these games, you're almost immersed in cinema, and you're almost like an actor in, in these, so they're, it's, they're incredibly immersive. So you have this synergy going on, and of course, at this point in time, the video game industry itself being aligned so much with uh, uh, the proximity between the, the White House and the video game industry being so close, the narratives are very much in line with uh, Western foreign policy. And so at the same time, what you have is you have games that are trying to look more lifelike, but this lifelikeness is being conflated with the legitimacy of political intention. So the more the virtual world is real, the more the actions of those people who play those games and who are playing essentially Western soldiers in battle uh, become sort of conflated with this idea of legitimacy. So uh, uh, it's interesting because if you look at these games, it reminds me of the work of Richard Grusin, who's a media theorist, who said that after 9-11, because 9-11 came out of nowhere, uh, the Western media industry started to assume the logic of the sort of post-9-11 security discourse of preemption. And the idea here is in pre-mediation is that the media starts to bring from the future into the present things that have not yet happened, which is what preemption is all about. Preemption is about imagination and speculation. It hasn't happened yet, but it will happen, maybe, 
but we still need to bring it into the present. We need to realize it. Well, this is exactly what these games do. But also, these games also become a form of interpolation that works with the idea of priming. And priming is, in many ways, a way in which we see preemption work today. And I won't read through it because it's too long. But essentially what Masumi is saying is that in, in the post-9-11 era, threats have not happened, but we, we, we realize them in the present. And you can see that with the, the terrorist-coded alert. It's, it's a monotonic device. It's a temporal device. The threat hasn't happened, but we have to make it, we have to bring it into the present. We have to make people aware of it. So this is what the video games do. And of course, in the, in the Modern Warfare series, which is a, which is a very popular series, a billion-dollar industry, uh, what we see here is we see the fears and phobias of the Cold War resurface in the form of ultranationalism in Russia. And so the leader of the ultranationalist uh, movement, the bad guys in Russia, are in many ways uh, this sort of uh, idea of a, of a um, strong sort of uh, uh, Russia but in many ways very paramilitary. So it's interesting because in the game, the symbols that the ultranationalists use are the same symbols that the nationalist Bolshevik party had. And the ideology of the leader of the nationalist movement is exactly the same as Alexander Dugan. So, you know, these games are very, very interesting. And when you play the game, the only flashback in the game is to Chernobyl where the situation is that, uh, it, you know, it goes back 20 years where the Americans know that, that, uh, that this ultranationalist leader, before he becomes the ultranationalist leader, needs to be uh, taken out. And so the game goes back to Chernobyl. So the gamer himself is witness to the instability of the Soviet Union, right, as a dangerous, as a dangerous entity. So in uh, Modern Warfare 2, which is a sequel to it, all of a sudden the na ultranationalists um, gain power, and they gain power because they create a false flag uh, operation uh, with, a T with a CIA operative who's blamed for a terrorist attack in Russia, where you as a player play this undercover agent who's with these ultranationalists, and... Um, and what happened? You, you must be closer to Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I just got carried away. Anyways, <laughs> the game is interesting because it's one of the first games that have ever had the ability of a player to kill a civilian. And yet in this game, you kill Russians. You kill Russian civilians. And if you don't, you lose the game because you become discovered. And, uh, you know, this would never happen in America, right? So here you have a gamer being able to kill Russians, you know. Um, and, of course, the, ban the game was, you know, banned in Russia, or at least this segment of the game was take had to be taken out. But essentially, it shows, it shows in many ways this sort of idea of a secondary class, I think. You know, this idea of value, hierarchy of value in life, where there are some people who are more valuable than others, and in this case, Russian civilians are not uh, as, as uh, sacred as Americans. And of course, in this game, you see the fear of invasion again. You see the return of 9-11 because the ultranationalists invade Russia, or I'm sorry, they invade Washington, and they, the whole game takes place in the suburbs of, Wa of Washington, D.C., so here you have the American defending the homeland, right? So uh, just to conclude, uh, games are popular because they work, as I said before, as a form of competition. But in order to win the game, you have to internalize the logic of the system. There's no, there's no room for negotiation. There's no room for diplomacy. It's just military actions. And... Uh, players must perform these missions. Uh, uh, it calls into, 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 into uh, prevailing modes of understanding and, and, and actions that embrace military force solutions, preemption. So I just uh, close with a, a line from uh, Alexander Galloway. Um, 
As a product of force, play will become more and more linked to broad structures, social structures of control. Today, we are no doubt witnessing the end of play as a politically progressive or even neutral, politically neutral. So, uh, you know, as you can see from here, um, essentially what we see today with games is the uh, idea of these be becoming a very strong form of propaganda and as a, as a device in which to uh, exert uh, a certain sense of legitimacy in military force solutions. Thank you.